Okay. This morning I want to talk to you about the assassination of President Kennedy. Certainly one of the most famous crimes in American history. And what I want to do today is to illustrate aspects of the assassination that are part of a controversy because ever since it happened on November 22nd, 1963, there has been a tremendous amount of disagreement among researchers about whether or not the Kennedy assassination resulted from the work of a lone assassin, as the Warren Commission claimed, or that of a conspiracy, as most researchers who have studied the subject claim. And the best way to do that, I think, is to illustrate some of the aspects of the assassination with a series of photos and I think that any reasonable person would conclude that the evidence overwhelmingly proves that there was a conspiracy. Now there is another side to the story and in my book the JFK assassination debates I do bring out the other side of the story as well. Those who believe that the accused assassin Lee Harvey Oswald did it all by himself. But, in fact, I don't agree with that, and most researchers don't, do not agree with that. So, let's begin by taking a look at what happened. President Kennedy was riding in a motorcade in downtown Dallas, Texas. The motorcade had just gone through the main part of downtown Dallas, had turned from Main Street made a right-hand turn onto Houston Street, traveled one block, and then turned left, made a sharp left-hand turn onto Elm Street. And what you see here on this first photograph is the motorcade. The Kennedy limousine is the first vehicle. Directly behind it is a Secret Service car. The third car, the white, the uh, dark-colored car is the car for Vice President Lyndon Johnson and behind it the white car is that for the Secret Service follow-up. One of the most interesting aspects of this case I believe is the <coughs> fact that even after the first shot was fired and this photograph was taken after the first shot was fired the Secret Service riding in Kennedy's limousine did not react the driver of the limousine actually slowed down after the first shot and the Secret Service agent sitting in the right front seat and you'll see a clearer shot of him later on did nothing throughout the shooting sequence. By way of contrast, Vice President Lyndon Johnson in his car, the Secret Service agent sitting in the right front seat immediately after the first shot, jumped into the back seat, knocked Johnson to the floor and covered him with his body. Why the lack of reaction by Kennedy's Secret Service agents and the response by Johnson's has never been established. Okay, next picture. Here is a photograph of the front entrance to the Texas School Book Depository Building, located to the right rear of where the limousine was at the time of the shooting. This is the entranceway that, according to the Warren Commission, Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused assassin, walked out onto the front sidewalk three minutes after the shooting, and then Oswald walked down to your right, seven blocks down Elm Street, and caught a bus. <coughs> okay, next photograph. Here is a photograph showing a railroad yard, and to the upper left a part of a parking lot. This is located behind an area known as the Grassy Knoll, which was located to the right front of where the limousine was located at the time of the shooting. The Grassy Knoll is the source of many people, who, myself included, who believe that at least one of the shots came from there. One minute after the shots were fired, a Dallas police officer like many other people, ran up to in the direction of the grassy knoll. He climbed over a wooden fence and saw a man trying to get into a parking lot. The man into one of the cars in the parking lot. The man got into the car. He, the Secret Service, I mean the police officer, stopped him. The man pulled out Secret Service identification and then he drove off. 
we know he was not a real Secret Service agent. All genuine Secret Service agents remain with the motorcade on their race to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. So somebody was impersonating a Secret Service agent on the parking lot behind the grassy knoll a minute after the shooting. Okay, next slide. Here is the front entrance to Parkland Hospital emergency room area. Okay, next photograph. Here is the first of several slides I'm going to show you to illustrate the almost unbelievable lack of care taken dealing with criminal evidence in this case. We have a case here where the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, and the Governor of Texas, John Conley, were shot. If anything, great care should have been taken to preserve evidence, but in fact, this was not done. The clothing of a gunshot wound victim is very important evidence in a homicide case. Here we see a Texas congressman carrying Vice, I mean, uh, Governor Conley's clothing out of the emergency room entrance. Governor Conley's clothing were taken to his house, given to Mrs. Conley. She waited a couple of months, nobody did anything, so she sent it to a dry cleaners, which of course obliterated any evidentiary value it may have had to begin with. And finally, only after it had been dry cleaned, was Conley's shirt and undershirt and suit jacket taken by the authorities and examined. Okay, next slide. Another scene outside the emergency room entrance to Parkland Hospital. Okay, next slide. Here's another example of the lack of proper police procedures in a criminal case. Everybody has seen CSI, Law and Order, and other programs of that kind. You know the very first thing that happens in a criminal case. When the police arrive on the scene, what do they do? They seal off the scene of the crime with the yellow crime scene tape. At no time <coughs> was Dealey Plaza ever sealed off. Here, a photograph taken 15 minutes after the shooting. You see traffic proceeding on Elm Street as if nothing had happened. Spectators wandering in and out of Dealey Plaza without being questioned by the authorities. No serious search was made of evidence to find evidence in Dealey Plaza. The very next day after the assassination, an 18-year-old college student found a piece of President Kennedy's skull in the median on the other side of Elm Street. No search had been made. Okay, next photograph. Here, if you can raise that just a tiny bit, I don't know if we can, but anyway, the, a for, no, go back. That's okay, we can see it. This photograph was taken about 15 seconds after the assassination. It's a blow up of a photograph of the Texas School Book Depository Building taken by one of the photographers in the back of the press motorcade. He heard shots and was simply shooting scenes of Dealey Plaza and this is a blow up. The <coughs> half open window on the upper right is the window, the sixth floor southeast corner wind window from which the Warren Commission claims Lee Harvey Oswald fired all the shots. Yet directly beneath the sixth floor window you see two men looking out of the fifth floor window and clearly and obviously neither man is reacting as if any shots had been fired from them, from directly above their heads. Okay, next photograph. Here is a view of the inside of the Texas School Book Depository, sixth floor. The whole sixth floor was one big room. It was a storage room, a warehouse type facility where boxes of school textbooks were located. Okay, next photograph. Here's another, the bottom photograph shows another view of the sixth floor of the Book Depository building. You can see all the stacks of cartons of school textbooks. These are elementary school mathematics, reading, and so forth, textbooks for schools. 
the upper photograph shows the view from the sixth floor window of the book depository building that an assassin, say Lee Harvey Oswald or anyone else would have had of Elm Street. Okay, next photograph. Here is a photograph taken through the telescopic sight of Oswald's rifle <coughs> from the sixth floor window. There's an FBI reenactment vehicle that's concealed by the leaves of a live oak tree from the sixth floor. An assassin who wanted to fire a shot would have had to wait until the vehicle had moved from behind the leaves of the live oak tree because nobody would seriously shoot at this particular point because you simply can't see. There are two FBI agents sitting in this vehicle simulating Kennedy's and Connolly's positions. Okay. Here we have an interesting couple of slides, both of them taken directly from the Warren Commission's own evidence. The upper photograph shows the, a view from the sixth floor window of the FBI reenactment vehicle, the white convertible. When it was on Houston Street heading towards the book depository building. The bottom photograph taken through the telescopic sight of Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle shows the kind of shot that Oswald would have had had he fired when the limousine was in this position. And you can see clearly for yourself that a lone assassin, nobody else involved, no other gunman, would obviously have fired now because there's a point blank shot right between the eyes of Kennedy. Why would a lone assassin wait for this limousine to turn the corner, to make a sharp left-hand turn, then drive past the live oak tree that we just saw, and then go from past the live oak tree and then have a shot only of the top part of Kennedy's back and the back of his head when it had, he would have a perfect shot right here, right between the eyes. This question's never been answered. Okay. Another example of the lack of handling of evidence. Outside the emergency room entrance to Parkland Hospital in Dallas where Kennedy and Conley were taken, you can see for yourself dozens if not hundreds of people swarming all around, touching vehicles that were in the motorcade. No attempt made to for crowd control. Two bullet fragments belonging to Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle were allegedly found on the front seat of Kennedy's limousine. I say allegedly because we don't have any photographs of them in place, another failure of to follow proper police procedure. And why would they not photograph them in place if indeed fragments were found? But it's very interesting to note that at approximately this same time when all of these people are milling around here with the opportunity for somebody to plant bullet fragments in the limousine, Jack Ruby, Lee Harvey Oswald's killer, was seen at Parkland Hospital by two separate witnesses. Okay, next photograph. Another view of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building taken about two minutes after the shooting. The second window from the top on the right is the window from which Oswald allegedly fired the shots. If you recall the previous photograph I showed you, and look at this photograph, you can see how boxes of school textbooks have actually been rearranged differently from those that were in the previous photograph. Somebody moved boxes around in the minute, the two minute time period after the shooting, and it could not have been Lee Harvey Oswald because Oswald was elsewhere at the time. And here's a very interesting point. One minute and 30 seconds after the shooting, two people 
a Dallas police officer and the superintendent of the book depository building saw Lee Harvey Oswald in a second floor lunchroom standing in front of a Coke machine. So if you believe the lone assassin thesis, then Oswald must have fired the shots, walked all the way across the sixth floor of the book depository building from the southeast corner to the northwest corner. Remember, it covers a whole floor of the building. Gone down four flights of stairs, gone into a lunchroom, took a nickel out of his pocket. Yes, Coke's cost a nickel in 1963. Put it in the Coke machine, got a Coke out, and was drinking a Coke before the officer and the, his boss saw him there. It's, and Oswald, according to both of them, was not out of breath, was not agitated or nervous or anything. A, a man who has just killed the President of the United States and wounded the Governor of Texas. Okay, next. The only eyewitness who claims to have seen Lee Harvey Oswald firing a shot said that Oswald was standing up when he was firing. And you can see clearly here a police officer standing next to the window. A normal sized man could not possibly have fired through from that window without shooting through glass because the window was open only 15 inches from the ledge which goes all the way down to the floor. It, it wasn't even at knee height. And therefore this witness who wasn't wearing his glasses at the time could not possibly have been accurate. Okay, next photo. Immediately after the shooting, witnesses in Daly Plaza began running in the direction of the grassy knoll, which was be to the right front of where the limousine was at the time. It's to your upper left looking at this photograph here. Why people run towards the scene of shooting, I don't know, but nevertheless it happens frequently. Okay, next slide. Once again, another view of traffic on Elm Street 15 to 20 minutes after the shooting. People milling about, walking around, people wandering in and out of Daly Plaza. Nobody is stopped by the authorities. The scene of the crime is not sealed off. It's just almost <coughs> mind-boggling to think about the lack of just fundamental police procedure here. But nevertheless, it did happen. Okay, next photograph. Here is the rifle that Lee Harvey Oswald is supposed to have used to kill President Kennedy. It's a bolt action Italian rifle, a Mannlicher Carcano, six and a half millimeter, which equates to 25 caliber in American terminology. It's a bolt action rifle, meaning you have to cock the bolt of the rifle, fire a shot, and then cock the bolt again before you fire another shot. Okay, next slide. The first of several slides from the Zapruder film of the assassination. A man named Abraham Zapruder was standing between the book depository and the grassy knoll to the right front of where the limousine was and filmed the motorcade, focusing, of course, on the Kennedy limousine. Here, Kennedy is simply smiling and waving to the crowd. Nothing has happened yet. The limousine proceeds forward. Next uh, photograph. It continues to proceed forward. Next photograph. Until it disappears behind a street sign and then reappears behind the street sign for one second in actual time. Okay, next photograph. Now we can see President Kennedy appear. Sometime during that one second he, that the limousine was behind the street sign. Kennedy was hit by the first shot. Kennedy's hands are moving up towards his face. He begins wincing in pain. Jacqueline Kennedy, seated to Kennedy's left, starts to look over towards him because she has heard the shot. Okay. Here we have a wide angle view. This is how the actual Zapruder film looks, a wide, a the whole limousine is in focus here, okay. 
next a blow up of the same slide that we just saw. Kennedy has obviously been hit. He's hunched forward, his hands are going up towards his face. Governor Conley, seated directly in front of President Kennedy, however, appears not to have been struck at all. Kennedy shows no evidence of pain. The, he is holding his 10-gallon Texas Stetson hat in his hand, and yet a fundamental part of the Warren Commission's thesis is that at this stage of the motorcade, Conley has been hit by the same bullet that's gone through Kennedy. According to the Warren Commission, Oswald fired a shot, that bullet went through Kennedy's neck, exited from his throat, then that same bullet went on to strike Conley in the back, go through his chest, exit from the chest, go all the way through his right wrist, shattering the radius, the wrist bone, and then lodging in his left thigh. Conley shows no evidence of reaction to any of this at this point. And it's not simply what you and I are seeing with our eyes, but the Dr. Robert Shaw, the thoracic surgeon who operated on Governor Conley, also said that it's impossible for Conley to have been struck here. Dr. Shaw, by the way, was the head of the thoracic surgery unit for the U.S. Army in France during World War II. He had a great deal of experience in treating gunshot wounds of the chest area. And yet, without the single bullet theory of the Warren Commission, the whole lone assassin theory collapses like a house of cards because Oswald or anybody else could not possibly have gotten off two separate shots, struck Kennedy, then struck Conley in the time limitations of the Zapruder film because we're only talking about a second and a half in time and you can't fire two shots from Oswald's rifle even without aiming in less than two and a quarter seconds. Okay. Now we move ahead. Governor Conley now begins to exhibit a reaction to being struck. Notice Conley, Conley's right shoulder hit his hair, and his cheek. Next slide, one eighteenth of a second later, Conley's right shoulder has slumped sharply downward. His cheeks fill up with air caused by the passage of the bullet through the right lung, collapsing the lung and forcing air up into his mouth, and his hair flies up on his head. Here's where Conley is struck a minute, a, a second and a half after Kennedy was first struck. Two separate assassins fired two separate bullets from the rear. Okay, next. Now, just before he is struck in the head, President Kennedy is leaning slightly backward and to the left. Jacqueline Kennedy is reaching over almost to grab him and pull him down into her lap. Okay, next slide. Now Kennedy is hit in the right temple area. An explosion occurs. Kennedy's head blows up almost. Brain tissue, blood, skull matter flies backward and leftward. The two police officers riding to the, on motorcycles to the left rear of the limousine were hit in the face with blood and brain tissue. The two, Kennedy's shirt, the back of his shirt was covered with blood. Kennedy himself flies violently backward and leftward. Okay, go through the next few slides rather quickly. You can see how fast he goes. These are one eighteenth of a second in duration. Now he bounces off the left, the back seat and bounces forward. You can see the enormous gaping hole in the right front area of Kennedy's head. Most experts believe that a an explosive bullet, such as a dum-dum bullet, was fired from the grassy knoll area from the right front and exploded against the right front side of Kennedy's head. Okay, the next slide. The shirt Kennedy had on when he was struck. A bullet wound of entrance, a bullet hole, clearly is in the back of the shirt. The Warren Commission 
says that Kennedy was struck in the back of the neck. Yet the evidence of the bullet holes in the shirt and a corresponding hole in his suit jacket belie this contention. Okay, the next slide. An autopsy photograph of Kennedy's back. This is actually reversed. If you picture this reversed, the bullet wound is in the right side of the back corresponding to where the bullet hole was in the shirt. The Warren Commission says it was in the back of the neck, but you look at the back of the neck, you see no bullet wound at all. The bullet hole is in the back of Kennedy, and since Kennedy was seated in a normal position in the limousine, he wasn't hunched up like the photograph, the autopsy photograph shows, Kennedy was struck in the back and that bullet could not have exited from the right from the front of the throat as the Warren Commission claims. Next photograph. A close up view of what a bullet wound of entrance ordinarily looks like, a rather neat round hole with a bruising around the margins of the wound. Okay, next here is the bullet that the Warren Commission claims caused the damage in Kennedy and Conley. The Warren Commission claims that this single bullet went through Kennedy, struck Conley, shattering his fifth rib, and then caused a comminuted fracture of the radius and emerged totally intact, without a scratch on it. It's just simply not possible. Ballistics tests done with Lee Harvey Oswald's own rifle which, in which bullets were fired into goats, human cadavers, wrists, and other substances clearly show that as always happens when bullets strike hard substances, they are flattened, mushroomed, they're not intact as this bullet is. Okay, next photograph. Another view of the same bullet showing you can see all the lands and grooves of the bullet. Okay, next photograph. A computer-enhanced x-ray of Kennedy's skull showing the large degree of damage done to the skull on the right front side of the skull. You can see how the bones have been shattered all the way to the back of the head. And these little white specks you see scattered throughout the photograph, the x-ray here, or pieces of bone or bullet indicating that the bullet that struck Kennedy fragmentized, which is not the kind of ammunition Oswald is supposed to have used. Okay, next slide. Here is a x-ray taken from the front showing the same thing except that you can see it from a different perspective but the very large area of the right front portion of the skull was shattered to pieces you can see in the different planes of the, of the skull, the different little white specks of bone and bullet fragment, a massive explosion occurred on Kennedy's skull. Oswald's copper jacketed ammunition simply does not cause that kind of wound. You need other kind of ammunition to do that. Okay, next photograph. A photograph, actually this is a drawing made from a photograph showing the back of Kennedy's head. Some Warren Commission defenders claim that that hole you see near the very top of the back of the head, the, the, at the back of the hairline there near the colic, is a bullet wound of entrance. And if you look over to the right front, you can see a large flap of scalp hanging Actually, it looks up over, but in front of the right ear. Next photograph. A autopsy photograph of Kennedy lying on the table at the morgue, showing matted brain matter in the top of in the hair. Next photograph. Another view. This is a photograph here showing Kennedy's head 
The autopsy pathologist is raising the head up with his hand here instead of proper autopsy photographs being made. The whole post-mortem on Kennedy was done in a very incompetent manner. No experienced professional forensic pathologist was present. Instead, it was all done in secrecy at Bethesda Naval Hospital outside of Washington. Okay, next photograph. Another photograph showing the top of Kennedy's head. Next photograph. The right side of Kennedy's head, fo autopsy photographs and x-rays conflict with each other. Okay, next slide. Here you can see taken from the top, look below Kennedy's Adam's apple in the neck area. You see a very large gaping hole that the Warren Commission claims is a bullet hole of exit from the bullet that entered the back of the neck. In fact, when Kennedy was brought into the ER at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Kennedy had a tiny little puncture wound in the front of the throat, just below the Adam's apple. The wound, according to the Dallas doctors and nurses who treated him, was four by six or three by five millimeters in size, one-fifth by one-eighth of an inch, in other words. That's a bullet wound of entrance, which they all fought. During the emergency resuscitation measures performed on Kennedy, one of the Dallas surgeons did a tracheotomy incision right through that wound. Now, a tracheotomy incision ordinarily is made with a scalpel. It is cut through just wide enough to insert the endotracheal tubes into the breathing apparatus of the body, of course. This looks like a meat grinder went through because by the time the body left Dallas and arrived at the morgue in Bethesda, that tiny little hole with the tiny little trach incision suddenly has become a wide gaping wound that is made to look like a bullet wound of exit when in fact it's not. Okay. Next slide. Here's Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused assassin of President Kennedy. Oswald's rifle was found on the sixth floor of the depository building. Several fingerprints of Oswald's were found on the 19 book cartons found near the sixth floor southeast corner window. Although Oswald worked in the book depository, so his fingerprints there, of course, mean no more than yours and my fingerprints do in this classroom. And I might add that while three prints of Oswald's were found, 24 prints of Dallas police officers were found on the same boxes. Give you another idea of the handling of evidence in this case. Oswald was arrested in a movie theater at approximately 1.15, I mean 1.45 p.m. A Dallas police officer, J.D. Tippett, had been killed and in a residential area of Dallas four miles from Dealey Plaza. Oswald was arrested in a movie theater and taken to Dallas police headquarters where he was originally charged with shooting the police officer, but later he was charged with killing Kennedy as well. Oswald was not given the legal rights that people accused of committing crimes are ordinarily entitled to, such as having an attorney present at all times. And as you can see, he was forced to answer reporters' questions. Okay, next slide. Once again, Oswald in custody at Dallas Police Headquarters the evening of the assassination. Two days after the assassination, before a nationwide audience on live television, as Lee Harvey Oswald was being led out of police headquarters into the basement parking garage, a man named Jack Ruby rushed out of a crowd of police officers and journalists and fired one shot into Oswald's abdomen. The bullet penetrated through several internal organs, causing massive internal hemorrhaging. 
Oswald was rushed to Parkland Hospital where emergency surgery was performed on him by many of the same doc doctors who treated Kennedy, by the way, but the same result happened. Oswald died during surgery. Jack Ruby had a long history of ties to organized crime, but the Warren Commission concluded that Ruby's action was that of an act of impulse. In other words, the official explanation is that we have two lone gunmen in this case. Oswald killed Kennedy, wounded Conley, and then killed a Dallas police officer, plus Ruby killed Oswald. Neither one of them was put up to their acts by anybody else. There was no conspiracy of any kind is the official version. Okay, next slide. One of the few pieces of evidence that was handled carefully in this case was a fried chicken lunch found on the sixth floor of the book depository. One of the African-American men who worked on the fifth floor, and you saw his picture in a slide I showed you, was eating a fried chicken lunch on the sixth floor, and after he finished, he simply threw his chicken bones and wax paper and paper bag and Dr. Pepper bottle on the floor there. He got up and left, and by the way, he was no more than 15 feet from where Oswald was supposedly awaiting Kennedy and said he saw and heard no one. And it turns out that this evidence was meaningless because it had nothing to do with the assassination. Two people saw Oswald with a paper bag in his hand. Okay, next slide. And both of the, the morning of the assassination, both of the witnesses said that the paper bag Oswald carried was a normal size brown paper bag like you would get from a supermarket or other department store or whatever, approximately two feet long, give or take an inch or two. The Warren Commission claims that this is the bag that Oswald carried into the book depository the morning of the assassination, a paper bag more than three feet long, quite obvious. It's hard to forget because it's even when disassembled, the rifle that Oswald had could, could not fit into a package less than three feet long. And therefore, Lee Harvey Oswald had to, according to the official version, carry the rifle into the building in that bag on the morning of the assassination. Now, <clears throat> to wrap up, there's a tremendous amount of controversy about the Kennedy assassination. One of the questions that's intrigued me all of these years as a historian is that if indeed there were no conspiracy, if Lee Harvey Oswald did it all by himself, if there's nothing to hide, then why was there this massive cover-up of evidence in the case? In the Kennedy assassination case, there has been, and still continues to this day, a cover-up of evidence. In 1993, as a result of popular reaction to the Oliver Stone movie JFK, President Clinton appointed a, an assassination records review board to release documents on the Kennedy assassination still withheld by the government and more than four million pages of documents that had been classified were released. Four million pages of documents, not to mention films, photographs, and other pieces of evidence in this case. And once again, I would go back to that fundamental question. Why cover it up? Okay, we have time left for a question and answer session. So I'd like some volunteers to ask questions. I, I know you must have some questions, and if you would, go to the microphone. Who's got a question? Okay, go, go on. Okay, Sarah, you go ahead first. You could be a volunteer. Okay. Um, 
if there was a scheme and um, or a conspiracy to do this, was the whole Dallas Police Department involved? No. <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't. In the time I had, I was being unfair, of course. Uh, obviously, the overwhelming majority of members of the Dallas Police Force and, for that matter, other agencies, government agency, FBI, Secret Service, CIA, you name it, or honest, ordinary, loyal, patriotic American citizens had nothing to do with any kind of cover-up. Why the neglect of fundamental police procedures like not even sealing off the scene of the crime, I don't know, but it didn't happen. Okay. Um, and would Oswald, would he have um, volunteered to do this or was he chosen by someone? Uh, how did he end up being the fall guy or was he set up? Well, I don't know uh, is the answer that I have to give you to this question because Oswald could have fired a shot, of course. Oswald could have fired a shot. He could have been part of a conspiracy or he could have been, as he himself told the press the evening of the assassination, I'm a patsy, a scapegoat set up to take the blame while the real assassins got away. Kennedy. Kennedy's assassination has never been explained. And the what I think happened is that Oswald was a scapegoat. That he really didn't have anything to do with it, but with his background. Oswald was a defector to the Soviet Union. He had connections to CIA-related activities, dealing with anti-Castro activities and the like. He became the perfect fall guy to take the blame while the real people who killed Kennedy got away with it. Okay? Good morning, Dr. Kurtz. Good morning. Um, conspiracy theorists have always speculated about uh, an involvement uh, here in New Orleans, uh, especially with Carlos Marcellos, what, if any, uh, do you believe uh, did, Carlos Marcello, did Carlos Marcellos play uh, in the JFK assassination? Well, I think there's certainly a possibility. Carlos Marcello, the mafia boss in Louisiana, and Santos Traficante, the mafia boss in Florida, are the two main organized crime suspects in the Kennedy assassination. Marcello, specifically, because Dallas fell within Marcello's empire, Texas was part of his organized crime syndicate, that he would have had to give permission before Kennedy was killed, if indeed it was an organized crime hit on Kennedy. Jack Ruby worked for people who were very close to Carlos Marcello. In fact, Ruby made frequent trips to New Orleans where he met with many of the proprietors of strip joints and other establishments on Bourbon Street and the like, and was closely connected and indeed made more than three dozen telephone calls to organized crime figures in the New Orleans area in the three-month period before the Kennedy assassination. On his deathbed, Santos Traficante, the Florida Mafia boss, told a close associate of his that, I'm going to pretty up the language here, that Carlos messed up. He should have killed Bobby, but instead he killed Giovanni, the Italian, of course, for John. And coming from the lips of one of the most fearsome mafia bosses in the history of organized crime, Santos Traficante, that has to be given some credit, credibility. And of course, Jack Ruby killing Oswald, this has all the hallmarks of an organized crime hit as well, to silence him, to prevent a uh, trial from taking place. Oh, okay, we got one here, okay. Morning. Um, I have two questions. Okay. Was Conley ever interviewed by the Warren Commission and what did he say? Governor Conley was indeed interviewed by the Warren Commission. Governor Conley insisted that he was struck 
by a separate shot than the one that struck President Kennedy. Conley said, and what he says is verified by the Zapruder film, that he heard the first shot fired and he started to turn around to look at Kennedy seated directly behind him and he didn't see anything and so he was going to turn the other way to see Kennedy but when he started to turn back that's when the second shot hit him. He was absolutely positive that the second shot struck him and only him and the first shot struck Kennedy. And Conley had experience as a hunter. He knew the sounds of gunfire. He said he never heard the second shot because, of course, bullets move faster than the speed of sound. And so the impact of the shot on him. So Conley's testimony is strong evidence in and of itself against the single bullet theory. And the, um, the, you mentioned uh, Officer Tiffett, who was uh, killed. Is there any connection with that, with the assassination? And do you, in fact, believe that Oswald even had anything to do with that? It's impossible to say for sure, but Oswald was at the scene of the Tippett killing. Whether he killed Tippett or not depends on a lot of factors that I didn't have time to go into, but uh, basically, Several witnesses claimed to have seen Lee Harvey Oswald shoot Tippett, although there were several other witnesses who saw more than one person at the scene of the Tippett killing firing shots. And so you have two different versions here. Bullets from Tippett's body, removed from Officer Tippett's body, were too mutilated to match any of the bullets to match Oswald's 38 caliber revolver that he had with him when he was arrested. Uh, cartridge cases found near the scene of the Tippett killing, not by the police, mind you, of course, by spectators in the area, um, did match Oswald's revolver. Now, whether somebody planted them or not, there's no way of knowing. Oswald supposedly was walking down a s sidewalk in a quiet residential area, a Dallas police officer, Tippett, stopped him, even though Oswald was doing nothing but walking down the sidewalk, and called him over to his car, then, Os then got out of his car, and Oswald pulled out his gun and shot him dead, and then ran off. Uh, but there's a lot of controversy about the Tippett killing. I'm certainly willing to say that Oswald may very well have kill Tippett, but uh, it's not definite. Okay, let's see. Okay? Okay. Obviously, uh, Governor Connolly... You can Connelly, get in line. That, that's fine. Okay. Obviously, uh, Governor Connolly had to turn around after he heard the shot. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the president's wife, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, she was she had a full field of view of him, yeah. and what is her opinion? Had was she questioned? Did she have in regard Jacqueline to how many Kennedy times he was hit? Jacqueline Kennedy was questioned, but her what she said really did not make much sense, knowing the facts that we do, and it's understandable. I mean, her husband's head was blown off practically in her own lap, and she was in a state of shock. Immediately after the fatal headshot, Jacqueline Kennedy actually crawled out onto the trunk of the limousine. Uh, and almost fell off had it not been for a Secret Service agent from the follow-up car who ran and got onto the trunk and pulled her back into the back seat of the limousine. So I, she didn't really, you know, what she said didn't really, has no impact at all on this case, I don't think. You mentioned the Secret Service agent that didn't do anything whenever Kennedy yes. was shot. Was it ever insinuated or mentioned that maybe he had something to do with it, that maybe it was paid off or anything like no, that? No, not, no, and I don't, I don't want to insinuate that myself either because, of course, I don't know, but uh, certainly he neglected his duty. Was he like ever the <clears throat> No, not at all, uh, and uh, that's amazing because the Secret Service are trained to react instantaneously like the one who jumped into the back seat of Johnson's car and covered him with his body and the Secret Service agent who protected President Reagan after he was shot once jumped in front of Reagan 
and took the second bullet that Hinckley fired and so forth. But uh, no real investigation was made into the neglect by either him or the driver of the limousine, like I said, who slowed down after the first shot was fired instead of accelerating. Okay? Uh, I want to talk about the fingerprints uh, found on the sixth floor. What, um, I know I've read that they found other fingerprints that didn't belong there. They found the, the, the police officers, Oswald's, Oswald, but There was one print on those boxes that didn't belong to any known individual and was not on the FBI's master <coughs> file of fingerprints. And so somebody who had no business touching any of those boxes did touch it. Now, who knows who it was, though? But uh, there are strange questions about these uh, fingerprints. Also, I want to talk about the paper bag, too. Mm -hmm. um, a witness say they saw Oswald holding the paper bag between his underarm and his cuff of his hand right there. That's but right. That paper bag didn't it, seem like no, he could hold that. No, no. He would have had to be an orangutan to, to hold it like that. I, I mean, even a man my size, it's not, you, you can picture a yardstick, which is the length of that paper bag there. It, it's impossible to hold one end cuffed under your hand and the other under your armpit like that without some of it would have to stick up over your shoulder, and it simply was not that way. Uh, and also, uh, can, can you tell us what the involvement of uh, David Ferry and Clay Shaw had into the, uh, okay. with the Oswald? Yeah. And David, the Ferry, David Ferry and Clay Shaw were two f characters in the Jim Garrison investigation into the assassination. That was the feature part of the movie JFK, of course. Uh, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. Um, investigated the assassination and concluded there was a conspiracy hatched in New Orleans and that David Ferry, a former Eastern Airlines pilot and a rather strange character, and Clay Shaw, a retired prominent member of the New Orleans business and civic community, were involved in a conspiracy with Lee Harvey Oswald, a conspiracy to assassinate Kennedy. and. On the very day that investigators from Garrison's office went to Ferry's apartment in New Orleans to arrest him, he was found dead in bed. One of many mysterious deaths in this case that have never been confirmed by anybody. Uh, and Clay Shaw was eventually tried for conspiracy to murder John Kennedy in 1969, but he was acquitted unanimously acquitted by the jury, and I think quite rightly because Garrison simply did not produce the evidence to convict Shaw. Okay? Was the bullet that struck Conley intended for Kennedy and he got in the way when he was turning around to look at him? I think that whoever fired certainly intended to hit Kennedy but struck Conley instead because after the first shot that you saw Kennedy move like that with his hands going up towards his head. I think that the gunman simply missed. I mean, it's conceivable, of course, since we don't know what was in the minds of these people, that one of them intended to kill Conley as well, but uh, I don't think so. I think it's reasonable to say that Kennedy was the real target. The medical records, as well as testimony from various witnesses and other people who may or may not have been involved, how much of that was released? And do you think the ones that weren't released, do you think at any given time that they will be released okay. to the public? These autopsy photographs I showed you provide a perfect example. Had it not been for the fact that a Secret Service agent made a copy of the autopsy photographs for himself and then sold them to a researcher in 1982, we wouldn't have access to them e even to this day because the originals are still being suppressed. They belong to the Kennedy family, by the way, not to the government. And the Kennedy family won't let anybody except a few select individuals look at the originals. And <clears throat> why the Kennedy family has custody of them, I don't know because they don't have custody, say, for, of the Robert Kennedy autopsy photographs in California. But anyway, 
Other medical records were suppressed as well, including x-rays, tissue slides, and various other things. Many of them have totally disappeared off the face of this earth. And I don't think we'll ever find out, I don't think anything of substance is going to be released anytime, at least in our lifetimes. As you had said before, in 1993, four million pages of information had been released to the public. Was there any part of that information in the four million pages that we didn't already know from the Warren Commission? There was a lot of information about activities involving CIA, mafia assassination plots against Fidel Castro. That was already known, but more details have come out. There was more information about Lee Harvey Oswald's two and a half years he stayed in the Soviet Union, uh, information dealing with organized crime, no smoking gun material to say, hey, this is the key to the Kennedy assassination. We can put an end to it and say this is what exactly what happened. Like I tell my students in my JFK assassination class, we don't know who killed John Kennedy, and I don't think we'll ever know the whole truth about it, but uh, I think most of these documents do help to reinforce the conspiracy theory. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Kirsch, you mentioned that the Warren Commission founded that Jack Ruby acted on impulse in yes. killing Ali Harvey Oswald. Is there any evidence to the contrary? Yes, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Ruby was stalking Oswald from the time Oswald was arrested. Like I said, Ruby was seen at Parkland Hospital not long after Kennedy was brought there to begin with. On the evening of the assassination, Ruby actually got a press badge from one of his friends in the Dallas Police Force and was at a press conference for Oswald. But he was so far back with so many reporters and microphones and cameras in front of him that he didn't have a real opportunity to shoot Oswald at that time. Ruby appeared at Dallas Police Headquarters several times, bringing sandwiches and drinks to Dallas cops, many of whom knew him personally. So I think that uh, there was a very definite stalking of Oswald, and finally he got his real opportunity to kill him on that Sunday morning after the assassination but it was not an impulsive action. You also mentioned that he may have had ties to organized crime. Do we know which family he might have had ties to? Well, the, Carlos Marcella was the overall boss of the family. In Dallas, a man named Joseph Chivello was the head of the Dallas organized crime family, and there was a man named Joseph Campisi who was his underboss, so to speak. Ruby operated a couple of bars and strip joints in Dallas. Uh, a lot of the Dallas cops went there for women and booze and what have you. Ruby did everything from fixing parking tickets and other things of that kind. He was not a big man in organized crime, in other words. He didn't have a family. Uh, and so he was a, a perfect individual to use to kill Oswald because you couldn't trace him directly to Marcello or any other major organized crime boss, even though he had links to them. Thank you. Okay, I think we're, it's 10.30.